Well, hello and welcome back to the next episode of Debunking. In this one, we're going to get Stefan Milo's attempt to debunk Graham Hancock. I do 100% agree with Graham. Ha! Got him. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Boom. Well, hello and welcome back to the next episode of Debunking. And yes, that's right. In this one, we're going to be critiquing Stefan Milo's debunking of Graham Hancock's Ancient Apocalypse, Episode 5. Episode 5. And while we're going through this one, I know that you're going to be like, man, this guy just keeps doing Mini Minute Man. He keeps doing Stefan Milo. He keeps doing World of Antiquity. But look, this is like... Have you ever played Mike Tyson's Punch Out? There's like this whole circuit you've got to do and you can get to the next one. Well, I want to fight Bald Bull and King Hippo and Don Flamenco and shit. So I have no choice but to get through the circuit first. I'm sorry. I do 100% agree with Graham where at the start of the episode, he's talking about how light pollution has really cut us off from understanding and observing the night sky. That's really something that we lack in our modern world compared to our ancestors. And it's a big tragedy. Um, as Graham says, you know, people in ancient times would have had an unfiltered view of the night sky every day of their lives, unless it was cloudy, obviously. And, and they'd have been extremely familiar with the positions of all the stars and, and everything and their movements. This is why I find the fact that he uses astronomy as evidence for this lost civilization so uncompelling. Because, as he says right there at the beginning, people would be so familiar with the night sky. So it's really odd. He almost lays the case for why we don't need Atlantis straight at the start of this episode. Now, like I mentioned in my first video, before I dropped out of college, I did take a couple years of psych. And this is one of the things where it definitely makes me use that part of my brain looking at this. I can't help but notice that Stefan looks at that same piece of evidence a completely different way than Graham does or than I do. He sees no reason we need Atlantis at all to explain this. And, and I look at it and I'm like, well, if the age of the astronomical knowledge is sufficiently complex enough and sufficiently old enough... I guess we would kind of need an older civilization, right? But I can kind of see where he's coming from. So anyway, I just figured I'd mention that right off the bat because um, really at the end of the day here, we do just have two different groups of people or many different groups of people in the case um, that just have different opinions on it, really. The first thing he wonders is that why would people go to all these lengths to build these monuments? Is it to warn us of something? Uh, this idea I really have to push back on. They made these monuments because they're important to them. And they sincerely believed in their worldview as strongly as we now believe in our worldview. And we would create big monuments and big buildings and things like that. So the idea that, you know, we have to question their motives, why would they do this in prehistory is really odd. They would do it for the same reasons we do it, we do these kinds of things, because it's cool and we believe in it. He's talking about Gobekli Tepe here. And as I mentioned before, I don't think for one second that they built this stuff to try to send a warning down through the ages that you're going to get smacked by some rock from space. I think that's a little out there. Just a little. But I will say that I think it's a little bit dismissive of him to be like, well, you know, we don't, they built it for the same reason we built stuff. It's Gobekli Tepe, man. They, they didn't, there wasn't like there was this long standing history of people building megalithic structures. This was like this area of the world had just started this shit in the last little bit. So yeah, why they built it is a legitimate question compared to why they built a fucking granary. Uh, then he says that the Sumerians were the first civilization is crying out to be rewritten. I would say in the same way that Graham is really dismissive of hunter-gatherer societies, and that's sort of an old way of speaking. Describing constantly talking about civilization is not really the language that archaeologists would use anymore. As civilization is such a vague term, it's hard to define, it tends to promote a Eurocentric view of human development. Uh, the example always I like to think about is like Anglo-Saxon England is roughly contemporary with Teotihuacan. And at Teotihuacan, they were building these enormous monuments, huge cities, incredible stuff. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, they didn't have writing. Meanwhile, in Anglo-Saxon England, we are ab abandoning our cities, at least in the early period. And yeah, we're really going back to a much simpler form of life. The population of, of Roman Britain has crashed. We're really taking a step back in many, many ways. But we do have writing. So it's in the traditional view of civilization, like, you know, we would maybe, England would be more civilized maybe because we have writing. This kind of goes back to that psychology thing that I mentioned earlier 
to me, Stefan is supporting Graham Hancock's position. Hear me out. Rome developed writing and developed building cities, right? They were a fully-fledged civilization. The Anglo-Saxons did not develop either of these things. They abandoned their cities as soon as the shit went down, and they had one half of those two pieces of tech that we're talking about here. But the people in South America, they didn't have writing, but they had building cities. They also had one half of those two pieces of tech. Maybe they were also settled by another group of people or influenced by another group of people and then lost some of the tech, dropped writing but kept the big cities. Anyway, it's kind of funny how that works, huh? Where he says something, he's like, gotcha. And I'm just like, huh? You know, even though we know a lot about prehistory now and we know so much more about what our ancestors were up to and it's amazing stuff, I would say let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Sumerian civilization if that's what we're going to call it society was incredible they really are the first literate society and they really achieved a lot so you know even though we have we know we know about sites like gebekli tepe and all of that stuff let's not get dismissive about how awesome the sumerians were okay psychology time's done let's just have the real discussion now the Sumerians are so amazing because they didn't just develop writing and laws and shit, but they also built the first cities. They did all of that stuff at once. Not like the people in South America, not like the people in ancient England, like the Romans. They did it all. Gebekli Tepe, for those that don't know, it's uh, one of the oldest megalithic sites in the entire world. When it was discovered, I believe it was the oldest megalithic society Uh megalithic site in the world really stunning place graham describes it as recently excavated i don't know it was 1995 recently yeah it is dude just last week i got this at circuit city you ever played it it's really really fun no on a serious note dude hancock's old 30 years ain't that long to him and a lot of the information about gobekli tepe hasn't been publicly available for 30 years so you got to give him a little bit of leeway there it is a really fun game though I kind of feel like agreeing with him just so I sound young and relevant. Uh, but even when I was at university 12 years ago studying the Neolithic, we're talking about Gebekli Tepe. I don't know. Graham always goes on about how it you know, defies everything we've been taught about prehistory. We're just not being taught about prehistory. I think that's a shame. I think we should be taught more about prehistory. I wrote a children's book about prehistory, uh, available from all good retailers. Excellent Christmas present for any children, eight to 11 years old. We're not really taught about prehistory. So, and when Graham went to school in the 60s, so definitely our view of prehistory has changed a lot since he was taught about it in school. I don't know. I just don't know what he means by that, but certainly in the education I've received 12 years ago, we're talking about Gebekli Tepe. Even 12 years ago, there wasn't nearly as much on the internet and there still was a lot behind paywalls. You were at university, so that's a little bit different. But you go back into just to the 90s, you didn't even know where to go, man. You, you couldn't, there was no paywall to hit. There was nowhere to look. So uh, I, I understand that, you know, Hancock might be misrepresenting where archaeology was at that time, but you can't really blame him there because he didn't freaking know, man. And you can't really blame him for not knowing because the information wasn't available. And if it is available now, it's kind of like... He's researched this shit, you know, so it's like to him, how many times does he have to look at the same thing? You know, he, he's looking at, I wish he'd look at the fucking pyramids a second time for fuck's sake, but oh, no, 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 no. He's got to go to Bimini. So at any rate, we might share a little frustration there, but you get what I'm saying. He's, he's not going to keep researching the same thing. That's boring. This is his life, right? So uh, how many times do you want to research the same thing? How many times do you want to go back and dig in the same cave? Anyway, oh yeah, and I almost forgot. This is why you won't respond to me, huh? Because you wrote a book, and Milo wrote a book, and everybody seems to get a damn book deal, but I don't get to write no book. Fine, I'll just play my Sega Saturn by myself. You go read your children's book. But yeah, actually thinking about it, even in Graham Hancock's day, we knew that the Neolithic people were constructing megalithic monuments. Obviously, we knew about Stonehenge. But even in that region, there was the Tower of Jericho, which... Even in like the 1950s era, where dated to like the early Neolithic period. Again, I don't know why why Graham Hancock always brings up this phrase 
Uh, we've known that Neolithic people have built megalithic constructions for a long time. I think how Gebekli Tepe did change our understanding is that we probably would have thought that there was some more urban development before they built these huge monuments. Uh, Klaus Schmidt, the, the main person behind its initial excavation, sadly passed away, RIP. Um, but he had this famous phrase, Zerst kam der Tempel, dann die Stadt. Like, first came the temple, then the town. And probably before Gebekli Tepe, maybe we'd have thought about that differently. What, it's okay to make fun of accents? Sweet. Crikey, throw another shrimp on the barbie. I like archaeology because I'm British. Oh, look at me. That ain't no knife. This is a knife. I like Doctor Who and the Wiggles. Same country. Don't even get, don't even go there. Same country. I don't believe that there's two hemispheres. There is no way there's a bunch of people on the bottom half of the planet with all the shit falling out of their wallet. So save that for the mud flood, guys. I'm not, I, I deal in seriousness here. All right, on a serious note here, sorry about that. On a serious note here, let's discuss that. On a serious note here, he's poking at Hancock one minute for being like, why are you acting like this thing's such a weird enigmatic structure? And then the next minute he's like, you know, it is kind of weird that they didn't like build a city or anything. And we haven't even talked about the domestication of food there yet, which is another thing that's pretty weird about Gobekli Tepe. So it's kind of like... Just, just come on, man. I, I understand that we're making response videos and stuff, but but don't just like look for nothing to, to mock. I mean, it's like, what's next? You're gonna start picking on people for their accents and shit? Come on. One thing that did annoy me is uh, Graham said archaeologists accept that it dates to eleven thousand six hundred years old. Makes it sound like archaeologists are dragging their feet in talking about it like that. Archaeologists are literally the people who discovered it dated to back then. Um, so I just dislike that turn of phrase. Putting archaeologists down, man, who are making discoveries that are so central to his ideas. He's just putting them down. Even though I understand why Hancock has a problem with archaeologists, and even though I made a poll saying that I wouldn't, you know, critique different people in different videos, I'd keep it pointed. I do have to point out here that he's right here. Hancock really does misrepresent that part of it where it's like, dude... The archaeologists aren't the ones accepting it. The archaeologists are the ones doing it. And I will, as much as I point out that he's being pedantic about things and like nitpicking words, this is a case where I would have to agree with him. It's like, dude, that's a really sleazy way of wording it, which sucks because I really like Graham Hancock. Hitting me right in the team feels and stuff. Uh, another really misleading phrase is when he describes Gebekli Tepe as older than the domestication of the horse. That's so misleading because the horse is like the last animal we domesticated. It's older than the domestication of pig, cow, chicken, sheep, goats, wheat, rice, barley, corn, potatoes. It's older than the domestication of all of those. Um, but again, Graham Hancock can't really talk about food. Because then the next question is, well, what did people eat on Atlantis? Now, when I was doing research for this video, I came across something that made me do another video. Plug, plug. Um, and you should check it out because it talks about how they think that there may be evidence that rice was domesticated and then reverted back into nature. They call it feralized and then domesticated a second time. And I could be wrong there because I'm no geneticist, but I was reading a bunch of different papers. And I, anyway, the information's there. I'll put a link in... I don't need to put a link. If you're watching this video, you're probably smart enough to figure out how to go to my channel and press the buttons and find the video that I uploaded just before this video that wasn't a short. If you're not smart enough to do that, I'll put a SpongeBob link somewhere for you and you can click on that one. At any rate, um, I think it's worth pointing out that the hanging your hat on, we don't know what these people ate for sure. There's no genetic evidence for any of this stuff whatsoever. It's really dicey when you start looking into it. You start looking into the genetics and it's like, well, there are crops like rice that are eh, pretty... There's a lot of disagreement as to where all this stuff came from. What, there is an interesting debate as to whether Gebekli Tepe was built by hunter-gatherers, though, because it is described as that a lot. And that's because all the grains that have been found there are wild grains, not domesticated, because before the domestication of wheat. 
the animals that were found there are gazelles, I believe, mainly. Uh, no, no domesticated animals. But I think what we have to keep in mind is that domestication was a really long process, took thousands of years. The people that built Gebekli Tepe just because they're consuming wild grains doesn't mean they're not participating in the cultivation of them uh, or managing the landscape. So they're, the people that built Gebekli Tepe, I still imagine their lifestyle having a lot more in common with a Neolithic farmer than a fully nomadic hunter-gatherer. They're definitely, I'm sure, leading more sedentary lives, helping participate in the cultivation of these wild grains, I would have thought. This is the early days of plant domestication. You wouldn't expect domesticated grains to appear in the record as soon as people started living a lifestyle like that because it's going to take a while for the selection of, of grains to leave like a genetic trace. You see what I mean? Graham can't really concede all of this nuance because he needs people to have been taught agriculture. Now this is either the most deliberately misleading or openly ignorant things Stefan said throughout the entire videos that I've responded to him so far. In Discord, uh, one of my subscribers, Krein Brinka, uh, posted a couple of links and I was going through those and one of the things it points out is that it does not take very long at all for markers to show up in the record of genetics, of genetic uh, selection when we start domesticating crops, so it doesn't just look like, oh yeah, this looks like wild oats. It looks like slightly domesticated really fast. Um, another thing is the domestication and establishment of a food source that was consistent would normally be considered a critical prerequisite for building of great structures. Stefan is aware of this this is the reason Hancock hammers on about it, but of course he's bad with words talking about it because he's trying to forge this gorgeous story instead of discuss it to a scientist, so he doesn't discuss it like that. But that's really what the big trip is here, is that this just pops up with no prerequisite in place. And Stefan doesn't even mention that, which is really, really weird, to be honest with you. Inside are these enormous pillars. Hancock describes it as Noah's Ark in stone. I mean, he's trying deliberately to link it to those myths. One thing he really zeroes in on is that enclosure D is the biggest enclosure. It's probably the oldest enclosure and it's the most elaborate enclosure. He has all these phrases that, you know, you can't just wake up and build the largest enclosure that anyone's ever built. And, you know, the fact that the oldest enclosure is the biggest means that someone else has taught them how to do this. I really disagree with this idea. Like, if you look in your town, like in my hometown of Worcester, the biggest and most elaborate building is a cathedral that was built 800 years ago. And the whole history of our town since then, we haven't built a more elaborate building. Really? Seriously? This is, this is your evidence? This is your answer to that? Seriously? Let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, hmm, uh, was this the first time that people in your town had built shit? Was that big building and then they built all the smaller ones afterwards? No. Had, had the people that built that big building in the middle of town, had they presumably built lots of smaller ones as they developed their skills to... As for just waking up and deciding to do that, that that's obviously a ridiculous phrase on Graham's part, or how did, how did he put it? you know, succeeding brilliantly at their very first attempt at making a megalithic structure. Come on, that's so such a lack of nuance there. Who's Graham to say that this is their very first attempt at a megalithic construction? He can't go back in time and ask them. It ignores the fact that people have been building with stone for thousands of years before this, as I've already explained. It ignores the possibility that they were creating monuments out of wood before this time. And most importantly of all, it ignores the really obvious point that the archaeological record is incomplete. We could discover a smaller Gebekli Tepe tomorrow, a smaller and older one. Uh, who's Graham to say that this is their very first attempt at building a megalithic structure? That's where I got to put my psychology cap back on for a second because it's just so funny here how the double standard exists. If you bring up something and you're like, okay, the oldest evidence we found for it is 5000 BC, but I posit that maybe 8000 BC is when it first originated because of this, this, and this, but you've got no evidence for it. 99 times out of 100, they shoot that shit right down with, that's not how we do things, this is a science, bring me some evidence, show me the artifacts, 
this is the date this structure is dated to because this is the date that we dug the shit out of the ground and dated it to. Don't go any further back. I don't want to hear it. But in this situation here, as soon as we have Graham Hancock saying, you know, this this is our first attempt, all of a sudden it's like, whoa, 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 hang on a second. I'm sure that if we dig around some more, we'll find some other stuff. And here's the thing, is that most people will say that when they discuss it with other scientists. But when they're discussing it with some woo peddler, the very first thing they do is just be like, no, this is the date, that's the end of the story. You'll see it when we discuss Darren Kuyu down the road, how they just like hardline the date. And it's like, you have no effing clue what you're talking about here, but you're going to be like, Pfft. but anyway, double standard time, buddy. Uh, and then he literally just one minute later in the show mentions a possibly earlier site, uh, Carahan. Tepe. I don't know how you have these. Can he can have these two ideas in his head, or or talk about them side by side in the show like that? You know, you can't wake up and day one day and make a Beckley Tepe with no prior skills. You know, you need to work on things and get better and better. Oh, by the way, here's a possibly even older site. How can those two scenes in the show sit side by side next to each other? Note the term possibly older. There, the error for dating on these overlaps. So. They could both be the same age. Gobekli Tepe could actually be older rather than Karan Tepe. Th these are all both possibilities here because the dating margin of error overlaps for the dates. So you can't really say for sure when any of this came into existence exactly as far as which came first on these two. And in all honesty, when he's talking about like this culture that shows up with these things on the scene, when you're talking about so close that your carbon dating gives us a margin of error that overlaps he's talking about the same freaking society man you're i i don't understand how you don't seem to understand that he's talking about the same group of people more or less maybe two generations displaced or whatever but not people that had thousands of years of experience or hundreds of years of experience even building and stuff not long enough to get good at the things that's his point whether or not that means Gobekli Tepe was built to warn us from the future, blah, blah, blah. That's a different ball of wax. But this is just kind of ridiculous on your part, to be honest. Uh, Karahan Tepe is a crazy site, though, another megalithic site. I do definitely agree with Graham. That head poking out of the rock really has a sinister feel to it. Um, but it's not even the only earlier site that archaeologists have found. Yeah. You know, I've been following a lot of archaeologists. Shout out to all of them on, on Twitter who've been talking about this idea. Yeah, you know, Orhan Ayaz of Haran University. Shout out to him for sharing this information. Here we have sites 300 years older than Gebekli Tepe using wooden poles, uh, stones that are not T-shaped, you know, just flatter, simpler. Is this not evidence of, of the development that Graham is looking for well stefan didn't leave a link to any of these uh, sites that he was talking about here in his description which is fine i understand that he, he made a video that was covering the entirety of it and eventually he would run out of room i would imagine but uh i would assume that they're probably going to have the same kind of deal where the dates are just going to overlap there's a pretty fat margin of error when you're looking back that far with carbon dating so i i don't i don't know about all this it's 300 years older it might be 300 years plus or minus a margin of error 1,200 years older. Anyway, we go back to Gobekli Tepe. This time Graham's joined by Dr. Swetman, who believes that the symbols on Pillar 43 are depictions of star signs. And he creates this really elaborate idea that if you look, if you say these are star signs and you look at their position and then you look in the sky to when the stars were last in these positions, and it's going to point to... Um, 10,900 BC, the start of the Younger Dryas. This is just pure gibberish. In a show where I disagree with most stuff, this is really gibberish. Talk about starting with a target and working your way backwards. I love prehistory. I really love prehistory as much as the next guy. But let's be realistic. What the symbols meant to the people that built Gebekli Tepe, we will never, ever, 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 ever know. We can never ask them. They're long dead. They didn't write anything down. We can only come to very 
simple conclusions. You know, back before I dropped out of college like a big old loser, one of the classes I took was astronomy. And in the first few days, the teacher was discussing about the different chemical makeup of different stars, the different elements that make up stars around the galaxy. And one of the students was like, there's no way we're going to know what makes up a star. We can look at it, we can guess, we can think, we can spitball, we can write things down and do all this math, but at the end of the day, there is no way we can know blah, blah, blah. And then the teacher sat down and explained how the light from a star will throw the spectrum and then individual little lines will be missing from each different element. So it's like a fingerprint for each different element. And there is actually a way for us to tell what each star is made out of. And of course the kid sat down and was like, well shit, here's a science that I don't understand. I think you understand what I'm getting at here. On the one hand, we've got Stefan saying there is no way this could possibly be known. And on the other hand, we have a peer-reviewed published paper by an archaeoastronomer saying science, you know, is this vulture and scorpion a star sign and it's pointing to the sky at this particular time and blah, 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 and it's holding a comet or something or the sun? You know, we'll never know. We'll never know. It doesn't mean that, or did they just live in an environment with vultures and scorpions and they're, you know, representing their life and their environment in their art? That's obviously, you know, Occam's razor would suggest that that's what they're doing. <laughs> Are you... I, I have a hard time believing that you know as much about archaeology as you do. If I hadn't have watched a bunch of your videos, man... <sighs> Are you honestly trying to tell me they put up all these big rocks and they take all the time to do all this relief carving and put all this shit together for some Bob Ross look at the pretty trees bullshit? Seriously? <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> the astronomical alignments is like a brilliant place to start with it, especially with, like you said at the beginning, like the stars are ubiquitous to like we all see them, right? And look at how that pillar's laid out, okay? Honestly, just look at it and think about it for a second. Does that look like art or does that kind of look like a chart of some weird kind to you? Just, it... <sighs> fuck. To conclude episode five, well, the Neolithic didn't happen overnight. It really took thousands of years. Building these monuments didn't happen overnight. The idea that Graham said they just woke up and decided to do it, it's not supported by the archaeological record. We now have simpler sites that are hundreds of years older than Gobekli Tepe, and it just ignores the fact that we could discover more, and that they were building with stone, and that they were building with wood, and blah, blah, blah. All these nuance and caveats that Graham ignores. The idea that it, it's some sort of time capsule trying to tell us about a comet impact at the start of the Younger Dryas, we just can't ever know that that's really way beyond the scope of archaeology way beyond what we can ever hope to understand about them and again it's sort of putting us in their story is kind of a very arrogant self-centered view i would say no archaeology on its own won't cut the mustard here you're going to need to go to archaeoastronomy so either like science or defer to the experts and then you could you could pick with the people that that you know fight with uh, Sweatman's paper, there's people that argue with him. His paper is by no means definitive, but it is the only peer-reviewed published work on the matter. So there's that. You should probably have mentioned that in your video, but of course, you know, you probably just didn't bother to look. The same as uh, Mini Minute Man just was like, yeah, this has got to be just crazy-ass woo bullshit. Same as that student in the first day or whatever day of astronomy class was just like, there's no way we can know what stars are made out of. It's just disbelief in science from somebody who professes science <sighs> like i said before i don't think they were sending us a warning down throughout times that we should be aware of some meteors coming to get us but i do think they wanted us to know that they were there the same as we put that thing that i mentioned in the video response to this episode the mini minute man and here it is again at hoover dam we have a star map so that the people thousands of years from now that don't even speak english but still use the same horoscope will look at that and be like oh that motherfuckers built that thing back in the 1960s or whenever the fuck the hoover dam was built i forget 30s sure sounds good 
Anyway, there's a star map. This is, I'm not an expert on dams. Jesus, guys, come on. How can I, I can't know everything. <sighs> anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And we're getting close to 1,000 subscribers. Uh, for 1,000 subscribers, I am going to be doing the uh, response to the big-ass comments that I've been getting stuff. So that might be a big old long video of me just sitting down and reading that. Yeah, which apparently you people enjoy on the YouTube. So I'll make one of them. Anyway, thanks a lot. Have a good evening. I do definitely agree with Graham. That head poking out of the rock really has a sinister feel to it.